Welcome, everybody, to a special episode of Chess Center. It's our first ever Chess Center Awards show. Alongside me is Grandmaster Robert Hess. We are here to take a look back at the year that was 2015, bring to your attention all the highlights, all the lowlights. And on that note, Robert, what are some of the most memorable storylines that stick out immediately for you? Daniel, the year 2015 was a great one in chess. We saw the inaugural Grand Chess Tour where Veselin Topalov got off to a torrid start and then collapsed in the London Chess Classic. We saw Magnus Carlsen lose many rating points only to come back in December with wins in the London Chess Classic and with it the Grand Chess Tour and also the Qatar Open. We saw Fabiano Caruana transfer from Italy to the United States to form a three-headed monster with Fabiano Hikaru Nakamura and Wesley So, and of course we saw Komodo slay mankind and become the strongest chess player on the planet. That's a, that's a pretty good list of storylines there, and what are we going to touch on in this episode? Well, it's going to be a little bit different than a normal Chess Center episode. We're going to bring to your attention who was the player of the year as far as we were concerned after all of our research and all of our news reports that we do on Chess.com. What was the game of the year? What was the most interesting move of the year? We're going to try to touch on all those things quickly for you in case you missed any of those critical storylines. And on that note, let's jump to something we almost never cover, Robert, and that is... What was the top upset of the year? There were many, but for us, the one that will probably stick out in most people's memories was when Jan Ludwig Hammer took down the world champion and his fellow countrymen on home turf at the Norway Superfinal. In this position, it seemed like Magnus might be holding on, pulling his old resourceful tricks, but no. Bishop to d4 was played by Hammer. Robert, knight h6 checkmate is threatened, and that forced Magnus to do something he didn't want to do. Why don't you tell everybody what it was and walk us through what the next few moves were? Yeah, Magnus had to capture on the bishop on d4 here because the knight on a7 was also under attack in addition to the knight a6 checkmate that you mentioned. So Magnus was forced to sacrifice an exchange on d4. And after that exchange sacrifice, he gobbled the pawn a2. But here, uh, John Ludwig Hammer went b3, trapping the bishop on a2. And here's where Magnus really missed his opportunity. He had to move c5 but instead went rook to d8, which is just an error here because the knight hops into e6. And after a few moves, uh, John Lover Hammer made short work of the world champion. Yeah, he gobbled up the pawn on the seventh rank and then threatened checkmate on d8. Magnus stopped it, but not not for long. Rook d7 means that rook to c8 will, will be coming next move. And, and with that, Hammer shocked all of his countrymen and, and maybe the world in the process of pulling what we look back on as the upset of the year. Well, Robert, fans of Chess Center will recognize this game quickly as a, as a blunder of the week from about a month and a half ago. A move that was just inexplicable, and of course there were many blunders, and partly the reason we choose this one is because the standards for Nakamura in this match were so high. Everyone was really shocked when Fabiano Caruana kind of dominated the, the whole rapid and 960 portion. But tell everybody what Hikaru played in this position that we still have a hard time understanding. Danny, it's not every day you see a 2800 caliber player blundering on move six, but here Hikaru went F6, an inexplicable blunder. As we tell our students, you don't want to open up your king to vulnerability, but that's what Hikaru did, and queen h5 check came in quick order, forcing Hikaru to go g6, after which Fabiano gobbled up the pawn on g6 and simply took that rook on h8, up in exchange, a very easy finish from there for Fabiano Caruana. Yeah, he made short work of Nakamura and with it went on to win the St. Louis Showdown, which is one of the big reasons why we look back at this game as a turning point and we award Hikaru Nakamura with the blunder of the year. Well, Robert, you knew we were going to have to dig deep when it came to deciding on the move of the year. So many incredible tactics played, so many interesting combinations by the best players in the world. And surprisingly, you and I both came to an agreement that the best move by far was a subtle double exclaim king move. Not very often you see one of those. But in this position, Dennis Kismatulin started an amazing combination and really an amazing evaluation of the position when he played king to g1, letting the rook on d1 fall with check. Robert, explain Dennis's actions for everybody. Danny, you say two exclamation points. I say 50. This is the most, one of the most amazing moves I've ever seen. It's not every day you just give up your rook seemingly for free. Usually you sacrifice it for a vicious attack, which is actually subtly what he did after queen takes d1, king h2. It's not very clear how Pavel Elyanov is supposed to stop that running c pawn as well as protect his vulnerable king on g5. Of course, here, Elyanov went rook takes c6, just hoping that white's not going to get a second queen. But after the move 
queen to e7 check. Well, where's that king going, Danny? He made a few checks, tickled the king, and now took on f7 with the very brutal threat of queen f4 check. So it's not clear what Elianov was supposed to do here besides rook f6, which just seems like his last hope, but the move f4 check wins that rook, and after that it's all downhill for Pavel Elianov. Yeah, well, when you sacrifice a rook with check, it's got to feel good to get it back, right? Even if you're confident in your calculations. And uh, Gismatulin gobbled up that rook on f6 and made quick work of Elianov, showing no mercy, forceful moves, threatening queen e5 check, and now he's going to make it even easier to get at that king on h5 by opening up more diagonals with f5. And soon Elyanov resigned on queen to g6 because of multiple threats, including simple ones like queen takes h6 and just about any other move almost, almost self-mates your own king on h4. So backing this thing up, Sports Center instant replay style, I, I don't mind seeing that give and go, that dunk a few more times. King to g1. You're giving up a rook with check. It just doesn't get any more exciting than this. But as you highlighted, there are a lot of problems for black. And Kismatulin had the foresight to know that it was going to be enough for a rook sacrifice. And with that, he wins our Move of the Year award. Taking a quick break from the chessboard, Robert and I step back to give our award for the Chess Engine of the Year. From the graphic you can see here, Komodo made sushi out of stockfish. He dominated in every man versus machine match he played with material odds. So the ones that finished in a tide, like one with yours truly, Robert Hess, and Grandmaster Simon Williams, were still, in many ways, a show of the dragon's pure strength. Robert, what can you say about the year that Komodo had and, and really how he was able to separate himself from the, from the ways that the other engines are still misevaluating certain positions? Danny, Komodo is just amazing. You know, I had the opportunity to play it. It just was great. I was four draws, but of course, with materialized, that's a victory for Komodo in and of itself. But even in its match against Stockfish, you saw it overpowered the other engines. It saw it deeper. It didn't have as many problems with the depth horizon that we saw Stockfish have. And I think it just evaluated the position slightly better and beat Stockfish by seven points. As Alex Lunderman said, Komodo just always seemed to know where the pieces were. As you can see from the match standings, he won 53.5 to 46.5 in the epic 100-game TCEC Super Final. Not much else can be said, but we look forward to more battles between these top engines, hoping for some tweaks by the other top developers. Maybe these matches will get a little bit closer in the long run, but either way, he gets mine and Robert's award for the engine of 2015. As a website that covers chess events online year-round, of course, we had to have a section giving an award to what was the biggest and best online chess event of the year. And Robert, on that note, when you look back at the year 2015, what are some of the biggest and best events that stood out to you? Well, the biggest event, Danny, has to be the big show featuring Robert Hess. No, I'm only <laughs> kidding. That's a lot of fun, but it's definitely not top caliber. The runner-up is the FIDE Online Women's World Blitz Championship, which was held in Rome. Grandmaster Harika Dronavali from India won the event. It's great to see FIDE branch out into the online arena and hold such a prestigious event. But the winner, for sure, is Hikaru Nakamura defeating MBL in the strongest deathmatch ever here on Chess.com. It was viewed by over 5,000 people. It was a great match, and we saw Hikaru defeat another top 10 player in the world in Maxime Bashir Legrave. Yeah, great, and I'm going to have to agree with you. To me, the streamers challenge we did earlier in the year, inviting some of the world's best online chess personalities to duke it out in a tournament, also might make the list, but I agree that the uh, FIDE Women's Online Blitz Championship has to take the runner-up, and Nakamura MVL was the strongest Blitz deathmatch we've ever held. Looking forward to more events like that in 2016, and with that, we move on. Well, the Chess Center Awards just keep rolling out as we keep trucking along here, Robert. What was the tournament of the year in 2015? A lot of great choices. The Grand Chess Tour itself might take the Grand Prix Tour event of the year, but there really isn't an award like that. So our choice ended up going to the Sinkfield Cup. It was the middle event in the road of the Grand Chess Tour. We saw the emergence of Levon Aronian. And what else was it about this event that just made it so memorable? Dang, they're just the fight between the players. We saw in the first round, all five games were decisive. That's not something you see almost ever at a top-level event. But the players came out for a brawl. They had great chess. They're very exciting. We saw Veslin Topalov win a bunch of games, beat Magnus Carlsen again. But like you said, the storyline was definitely Levon Aronian, his reemergence back in the top 10 in the world. And it was a great showing by him, as well as one of the best games of the year with Ikaru Nakamura defeating Wesley So. 
Yeah, those are definitely great points, but unfortunately, Mr. Bobby Hess didn't take my bait as far as why this event was so memorable. So because of that, we're going to have to go to a clip right here where you're going to see some of the little side events that were taking place at the Singfield Cup and uh, will likely take place again outside the World Chess Hall of Fame if we can get Bobby to lace them up one more time. Okay, and we hope you enjoyed that clip. We hope that Robert isn't too upset reminding the world of, of where his football moves left his feet. For the record, it was a great match. Robert, do you wanna do you wanna say anything to the fans as far as as far as how that went down and what, what really was going on there? Danny, winners do their talking on the court, so I'm going to just let you keep talking and I'll keep walking the walk. <laughs> okay, well, look forward to, looking forward to that at the 2016 Singfield Cup, a rematch between me and MVL hoping to take place as long as MVL gets back in the Grand Chess Tour. And uh, more Giant Blitz and Bullet Chess. we got to get that for the fans. We hope that you enjoyed our pick for the Tournament of the Year, and we keep moving to the next award. Full disclosure for all the fans, there were so many games that made it to our final list. We had a spreadsheet of about 30 of them, but in the end, both Robert and I and just about all of our staff agreed it came down to two. Well, we couldn't decide. The day of recording this show for you, we decided that we were going to both cover the game of the year and the runner-up. We gave the runner-up right here to Wei Yi. The position starts, as you see, after he just played this brilliant sacrifice, Rook takes F7, rather than making the obvious recapture of the knight on D5. Robert, try to explain to everybody, if you can, what way ye saw both about the initial sacrifice here, taking advantage of some of the cramped pieces in black setup, but then also the foresight to, to the bigger picture plan of drawing black things so far into white's army. Danny, Wei Yi's preparation was extraordinary here. He just wanted to bring that black king out and really attack it and just checkmate in the center of the board. After the rook sack on f7, the king was forced to capture. A queen h7 check was the natural response. The king has to run out to e6. And then we gobble up the knight on d5 with another check. The king actually has a capture, which is unfortunate for black. And a phenomenal move, bishop e4 check. It sacrifices another piece, brings the king out further to the center, and as we noticed, the king kind of just played checkers the last few moves. It went from g8 to f7 to e6 to d5 to e4, all in the light squares. And here's really the, the key moment of the game. Queen to f7. You're not even giving a check, but you're taking away all the squares from the black king. And it makes it very difficult for black to escape. Danny, a phenomenal shot, queen f7. Absolutely, especially after every move before it has either been a sacrifice or a forcing check. To see that a subtle move like Queen of Seven really highlights all the dysfunction in Black's army. One piece, two piece, three pieces, four pieces. Yeah, you're up four pieces, but not everybody's playing, buddy. And that was enough for Wei Yi to take it home. Bishop F6, we're going to see a couple forcing checks, but then another really subtle move that comes in with Queen to B3. The Queen is relocating from H7 to the Queen side. And the Black King, along with all of his helpers, have there's no help coming, right? Not very helpful. A few more moves, a few more forcing checks get us to a position where after some desperate, some desperate uh, computer style sacrifices like Bishop takes G2, Black eventually runs into the uh, impossible position on H3 where there's about a million and a half threats here. There might have even been a faster way to mate from Wei Yi, but we're not going to focus on that because the truth is the combination was brilliant, certainly worthy of a game of the year award in any other year, but not this year. Are you wondering what our next game was? Don't go anywhere. Let's go to it right now. And now everyone knows they see it before them. Navarra versus Wojtaszek is winning our award for Game of the Year. Why, you wonder? Maybe you haven't seen this game. Well, if you haven't, I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview here. In fact, you might even call this a Tarantino. I'm going to Tarantino this position and show you that within 10 moves, that white king is going to be on h8. If you have not seen this position, grab some popcorn, maybe pause the video, and let Robert Hess be your DJ to take you to chess nirvana as this king is going to walk up the board. Robert, it's on you, buddy. Danny, I couldn't have explained any better myself. And the position started off looking pretty normal. White went king f2. It's the start of the king march, but it's a very natural move protecting the pawn on e3. Black went bishop h4 check, and the king said, well, why not? I can go forward. Let's do it. King f3. And e4 check says, well, you know, if you take with a knight on e4, my knight will come to e5 with check, and it's getting very dangerous for the white king. So Navarra said, hmm, I can move forward, so let's do it. King f4 g5 check 
And Navarro was not having any of it. He's not going backwards at all. He's going forwards. King F5. And Danny, after Rook H E8 here, do you, did you think that White could survive at all? I, I've never seen a king come so aggressively into the fray, with even with queens off the board. There are so many pieces still on the board here, everybody. The only other piece traded is a single knight. This sort of thing just doesn't happen. And the fact that white is willing to bring his king into this sort of death march was just a sign of good preparation and very strong intuition about the fact that black's pieces are always seemingly one step behind from reaching full coordination and delivering a mate. A few more moves show what I'm talking about. After white aggressively now starts to simplify. Watch that theme because if white can simplify, you might see this active king turn into less of a weakness and more of an asset as pieces come off the board. So Navarro plays rook d1 with that in mind, but Wojtaszek was all in at this point. He knew there was going to be a chance to checkmate that king, so he sacrifices his bishop with rook to g8 and goes for the mating net. Maybe after checks, you think he should have at least a draw, right? Navarro's probably going to go back to f8. Robert, wrong. We've already seen this as a Tarantino movie, right? We knew he played king h8, but tell everybody again, as I said, what black plays here, but, but the resourceful approach Navarro has to again just Keep black one step behind. Yeah, where well, Tachik played rook f6, threatening rook f8 checkmate. The rooks look like they're ensnaring that white king on h8. But here, Navarre found the resource rook to f1, which offers the trade of rooks. Of course, where Tachik's having none of it goes bishop f2, trying to keep that rook f8 checkmate alive. But here, Navarre plays rook takes f2. Remember, he started up a piece, so he's getting second piece for the rook, and then he swings his other rook over to f1, which looks like it just gives us the bishop on g2, so Wojtacek took that. But after rook takes g2, rook f8 check, forces the king up to c7, and now knight d5 check. Navarro must have seen 15 moves ahead to find this resource, and now, as you mentioned earlier, Danny, the king on h8 is a great asset in the endgame. Yeah, it's amazing that suddenly when all the smoke clears this king is becoming more and more dangerous there black's king itself is is in a little more trouble than white's and and the simplification can only help turn that active king into a a real beast in the end game we're going to see some pieces were traded and though uh proper analysis of this end game shows that white is the only one really with concrete winning chances maybe black had some better chances but we're not going to judge Wojtasha because as he said himself this this was probably the most enjoyable loss he's ever had in the uh, post interview from the tournament and after a few more concrete moves here we saw that two pass pawns are better than one Navarra narrows in he's gonna either stop the e3 pawn or just win it and Wojtaszek had had enough he resigns maybe the most memorable king march I've seen since what Robert maybe short Timon we also had a brilliant king move in our move of the year by Kiss Matulin so maybe it's the year of the king either way we take a look back at this as our game of the year from start to finish congratulate David Navarra and move on as we make it to our final award of the year, of course, we have to talk about the world's best. Player of the year was a really close race between two thoroughbred stallions. We ended up giving the runner-up award to Hikaru Nakamura to tell us a little bit about Hikaru's year. Grandmaster Robert Hess, go ahead and kick it off. Well, Hikaru Nakamura had a fantastic year, Danny. He won in Gibraltar. He won the Zurich Chess Challenge. He won the U.S. Chess Championship. He crossed 2,800 for the first time. He qualified for the Candidates Tournament, and the, win the winner of which will face Magnus Carlsen for the World Championship crown. He won the Millionaire Chess Open, and he just had a phenomenal year altogether. However, he still has never beaten Magnus Carlsen, who is the Chess.com Player of the Year. Magnus had a rocky road throughout 2015. He started off on a high note. He won the Granky Chess Classic. He won in Shamkir. But then he hit a rough patch. He lost some games to Grandmasters. We normally wouldn't see him lose to, but he came through in December. He won the Grand Chess Tour and the London Chess Classic. And, of course, he finished off the year right winning the Qatar Open. So Magnus Carlsen, back on his game, is the Chess.com Player of the Year. Yeah, and as we did so much research evaluating everybody's year here, we know that Hikaru Nakamura did reach the number two ranking in the world for the first time ever. But in the end, despite sort of a feeling, I think that most people had that Magnus was really struggling this year. Looking back, it was still just a phenomenal performance overall, taking the Grand Chess Tour, as you said, winning the Qatar Masters Open, the strongest open ever. We got to give it to Magnus. Magnus, congratulations for being our Player of the Year. And with that, we're going to mention that a full recap of other awards we did not get to mentioning here in this special episode of Chess Center can be found at chess.com slash articles. Go ahead and check out the other best and worst moments of 2015, according to our senior editor, Pete. 
leave your comment. Let us know how you think we did here. Let us know if Pete missed any big anything big or if there are any important categories you'd like us to add in our recap of 2016. And we will see you on next week's Chess Center.